Sound effects are a pretty major part of the catalogue of comics making. Sometimes they're done by the letterer of a comic after getting artwork from the artist, either through fonts or manipulation of fonts or painting the sound effects digitally. Or the artist may do them themselves, which will typically afford a level of interaction with the artwork that is much more difficult to achieve by other means. In Prince of Cats by Ron Wimberly and Jared K. Fletcher, Wimberly loves to use sound effects and he integrates them into his art in really brilliant ways. You're watching Strip Panel Naked, I'm Hass, and I'm going to show you some of the cool stuff lurking in the pages of some of the best comics. I think maybe it's worth initially talking about philosophy and sound effects, and quite what their purpose is. In Prince of Cats, it seems like Wimberly wants sound effects to be part of the fabric of the scene, not something overlaid afterwards to tell you what something sounds like, but actually part of the artwork to show you what that sounds like, and I do think that is a big difference. You can tell a reader where the sound is coming from and you can tell them how loud the sound is, but you can also show them that. And I think that is much more difficult unless you are actively interacting with the art for the sound effects, which is obviously much, much easier to do as an artist. And Wimberly takes good care of that. So the best way I can think to talk about this is just to work through some variations of sound effects Wimberly uses in Prince of Cats, and then discuss what they appear to be doing, and then maybe just set you all off to go and look at it yourself and figure out some of the other examples. Okay, so one of the first examples of sound effects in the book is Tack Tack of the Dice in the Alley. And everything about this is great. The background tack is more faded, it's less bright, the front one catching the eye a little bit because of its pure whiteness. But there's also a kind of spikiness to the letter forms as well, this kind of hard edge that denotes to me a hard edged noise. A sharp sound, not a soft one. And one that appears and vanishes quickly, and that seems to be implied by the size too, which is not huge, not overpowering, and certainly not taking over from the central image of the dice. That tack tack is supporting the imagery a little bit more. But Wimberly shows us what noise these dice are making. Wonderfully small little thing, and one that takes almost no time for you to register while you're reading this thing. I mean, obviously I'm here spending time analysing it, but when you're reading it, you just immediately understand the sound that's being conveyed. And that comes down to not just size, and not just the word itself, but the way the word is shown and its placement. Scale gives you one thing, and the word itself gives you another, but what Wimbley can do as the artist is really integrate that in so it does more than just those two things. Okay, so let's go to something else a little different. And this page has a whole bunch of different sound effects that are just all doing individual things, and each is just really fantastic. The first here is this big bring noise. And there's so much going on there, again, that culminates in you as a reader just kind of immediately understanding this and moving on. But let's take a closer look. The first thing that caught my eye here was the length of the words, obviously. The multiple eyes in the middle of the word elongates it, it stretches it out across an already wide panel, and it tells us that the word is long and in a sense repetitive. The three exclamation marks at the end throw us some volume, as do the size of the words and the pink colour, it's louder than anything else in the image, which is otherwise pretty muted tones. It's in the background of the scene too, behind characters, so it's either taking place in the background or the characters in the scene don't regard it as important and they place it in the background. Their body language may suggest the latter, which then also tells you a little bit about these people too. So these things kind of play off against each other, and this is one of the beautiful things that's much, much easier for an artist doing their own sound effects to do, make the lettering interact with the artwork in a very dynamic way that can teach you and tell you something about the story and the characters. If we move down, we see something very, very different. Someone shaking a spray can, and we get this chaka sound effect, repeated numerous times in the background, in a kind of like a chaotic pattern of different sizes and positions. Again, showing how this sounds, you know, in a spray can there's a ball bearing and it rattles around. Sometimes it's loud, sometimes it's less loud, but there isn't a specific pattern to it. And the noise is not a repetitive, similar noise, like a bell ringing. And part of that is just kind of understanding how things sound as well. You know, a bell is going to be a little piece of metal hitting another piece of metal on a sort of a motor or a trigger system, and it's going to be quite similar. That maybe sounds boring, but what it does is it gives you a sense of how to actually visualise these sounds. Because it's not so much just knowing what a sound kind of sounds like, but it's really understanding how that sound is created. Part of that as well is the letter forms. So the word itself, this chaka, in every instance, is a block. The letters are the same height and uniform in the way that the noise is repeated, it's the same noise. So each of these chakras is the same noise, but just in different volumes or in different positions with some chaos in there. And if you try shaking an aerosol can, that's about right. Because the ball bearing is going to make more or less the same noise, it just might make it at different frequencies. If you take a look to the panel on the right of that, which is the toilet flushing, you've also got this kaflush, which varies quite dramatically from the chaka. It's much bouncier, it's split into two by two tones of turquoise, so we can see it's a different kind of sound, and it's creating a different visual and different image to us as a reader. 
Again, we know what it is, we understand what it is, but these little elements can just help push and force that. Then of course the ksh noise of the aerosol can, it's literally the paint itself as letter forms, which gives it a cloudy, soft look and sound, and even shows us where it's originating from. And it's pretty big in the frame, so a big noise and an important noise for the moment in action, because it's pulling double duty. While the colour makes it a more striking sound that begs you to pay attention to it, compared to the way the previous two sound effects blend into the scene a little more readily. And this is just from two pages too, you know, there's a whole ton of brilliant sound effects in this book that I could go into with a few hours worth of time, but I'd recommend just grabbing a copy of Prince of Cats and looking at it to discover some of your own favourites, and just take a look how they seem to be working. And all of this comes back down to that same central philosophy of what a sound effect in a comic should be doing. If it's just there for you to read it so you understand the sound a thing makes, for example, you just have some text that says blip blop or deet or boom, that's fine, it can do its job. But Wimberley's philosophy on sound effects seems to be a little bit more than that. Again, it's that case of showing you what a sound feels like in a world. Because in life, when we hear an explosion go off, we don't just hear the word boom. We hear that sound fill the space. We hear that sound take over an area. It becomes everything we can see. And so building that into the way that it interacts with the art makes sense from the perspective of using sound as a piece of visual storytelling. And the cool thing about each of these sound effects is, as I mentioned, they don't require this level of attention because they so perfectly show you what they're trying to convey in a way that's just immediately obvious and readable. It's presenting it in an entirely unique and a very comics approach, which is to make it a form of the visual storytelling itself, layered into the artwork in a way that makes you think it could only be done this way. It's brilliant and it's comics. Thanks for watching. Strip Panel Naked continues to exist regularly because of the amazing support from the patrons. You get access to years worth of exclusive extra writing and content. I'd love your support too. You can find me on Twitter at HassanOE and the Eisner nominated magazine I edit at PanelXPanel.com. As always, hit subscribe and that notification bell to keep up to date with all the latest episodes and I'll see you next time.